Hey, welcome. Welcome, everyone, uh, to day two, R3 of Phosphor GNA. Um, my name is Alan Glennon. I am part of a startup called Arogi, which is basically like an open source research lab and group of operations research nerds. And um, we stem out of UC Santa Barbara and a group led by Rick Church, who's a professor there. One of his students is Carlos Baez, who's my co-author on this talk. The plan here will be for me to talk about 20 minutes. This is a begin, I clicked like the beginner button when I submitted the abstract, an academic track. So it's a little conceptual, a little nerdy, um, but I also want to make it useful, uh, practical. Uh, so I have links to various open source libraries that we've been using uh, that you can go find um, if you want to experiment with it. And also online at github.com slash arogi, A-R-O-G-I. Um, you can click there and you'll find a copy of this talk. So you don't have to write down links and stuff. You can just go online and find it. It's a PDF. I feel a little icky throwing PDFs on GitHub, but whatever. It's still there if you, if you want to do it. So first 20 minutes, me talking. Last 10 minutes or so, uh, Carlos talking about his master's thesis project uh, with optimization. Cool. So I was dealing with, I'm like an old school like GIS guy. Like in fact, my advisor, my PhD advisor was Mike Goodchild, like one of those like early guys. In fact, the guy who funded the first couple of years of my, my research was named Jack Dangerman. Um, I'm old school GIS. And um, after using this for years and years, I hung out with this guy named Rick Church, who's another professor, and he had a whole pile of interesting questions about finding the best place, uh, the best location, the best configuration, uh, how to schedule things. And with the GIS I was using, there wasn't a pull down menu or an easy workflow that translated into those type of problems. So um, this whole idea of optimization is geospatial problems that have a slightly different way of approach toward their solution. By the way, Carlos, whenever you say, I say something dumb and you disagree, jump in. He is actually a student of optimization and operations research. I'm a geospatial GIS guy who has embraced this as something like a really useful toolkit. So I guess it's about thinking different and it could, it's quite useful. I hope we'll uh, kind of uh, talk about that a little bit. And there's a lot of opportunities, both for you if you just have standard problems dealing with routing and those kind of things, or if you want to discover new shortcuts that exploit how to find the best location, um, the best path, uh, the best configuration, maybe the inside of a factory. Or, uh, you, in fact, one problem that our colleague uh, worked on before we started this little startup thing was rearranging the inside of retail spaces to maximize profit based on consumer behavior. So working on the insides of stores, where do I locate uh, like the quick grabbables versus the stuff that's really heavy? These are the type of problems. And then scheduling too. In fact, there's a geyser picture because the way I came across this, besides just knowing this professor who was kind of a nerd over in the corner, was I like geysers a weird amount. I mean, like you don't, like I really like geysers. If you type Glennon and do a web search for Glennon and geysers, you will see like all the web shrines there are to me enjoying geysers. Um, so one thing that I wanted to do with my, my super cool GIS was I wanted to be able to jump out of the car at Yellowstone at Old Faithful. There's a trail there and there's like 200 geysers all in that area. I wanted like the ultimate geyser visiting day. Like what, I wanna jump out of the car and based on the probability of eruptions, how could I see the best stuff? And you, you go, okay, if you do normal GIS, like what do you do, buffers, and you make like intersections. Um, basically, the workflows for GIS tends to be about comparison. Like you have inventories and you can get distances, but how do you add this balance of stuff? So with optimization, which is this approach, which I guess I'm selling, I, I'm not asking for money, but nevertheless, the thing that I, I have been using and found com, uh, very useful is this workflow associated with balance of trying to maximize stuff. Like say you want to get from your boat from London, you want to get your, your boat from England to New York with 
costing the least fuel, well, the first kind of thing is, well, shortest line, maybe a geodesic kind of arc to get there. But is there other constraints? If I actually take into consideration currents and weather, there may be other ways. And so I have an objective to minimize or maximize something within the framework of physical reality, our uh, socioeconomic reality. And that's what this is about. So cool story. Well, OK, big deal. It's all geospatial data. Why don't you just add it to GIS? Why doesn't Jack and Laura just assign a crack team and like, just add geospatial? Well, some of it they have. So like routing is you can kind of take advantage of the way networks are organized. And routing, I won't say it's a, like the point A to point B through a road network. Uh, it's not necessarily completely solved. But you can exploit the nature of the network to solve it very fast. Google does that really well. Uh, some of you may play with open source routing machine, which is what Mapbox uses. You can exploit the nature of the network to get something that's like crazy, insanely, magically fast. Um, so there are some cases, but optimization can do more than that. Like the inside, like inside configuration of like a, a, a grocery store or something. Um, the other part, in fact, uh, Literally, it's one cool part about being like a grad student at UCSB is, so I was having dinner with Jack, um, and he goes, well, why would I care about like the exact point that like the mathematically precise location that I should put my supermarket when I probably don't even own that spot? Using a heat map that gives me an approximation is probably good enough. So that's true for many things in geography. Standard GIS workflows are good enough. Um, Kind of a neutral version of why don't you add it is it does require a little bit different approach. In fact, since a lot of you are computer scientists, you may enjoy it. Might, this might be good news. It's a particularly nerdy approach that you do to uh, incorporate uh, optimization. Usually a set of equations, which geography students ne don't necessarily love, but computer scientists are like, yes, this is going to be like, I'm, I'm, I have a nice new barrier to entry, and I can have a competitive advantage. So the other, there are some bad news, though, is that some network problems, in fact, many, if not most, are every time you add an additional variable to your problem, let's suppose I'm looking at geysers. I go, OK, I need it, I'm constrained to the network. And now I need to take into consideration how fast I can move and steps through time and the utility I get from each of these locations. And have I seen Old Faithful already? Because I don't want to see it again, or maybe my I, I want to see it once, but the second time I may only get like 10% of the satisfaction. And you start adding these additional variables up, and you get problems that in some cases there's just not enough time in the universe to solve. And so uh, you get not, you know, NP complete uh, problems when there's too many variables. Uh, the good news is you are smart, and computers are ever and ever faster. And so uh, we have clever people working on solving the problems that you, you arise. And you may come up with shortcuts and heuristics, things like that, to solve these type of problems. Um, and then there are opportunities, particularly in the open source world, to take some of the existing libraries that may not be explicitly spatial, but can do really useful things, and add spatial, wait, spatially enable them, basically. So there's a lot of opportunities in open source to do that. And as I talk from here on out, we'll talk a little bit about the workflows, but finally a couple of examples in the libraries until it finally gets to the point of here are some general mathematical solvers that we're creating spatial APIs on top of. So specifically, here's like a typical inventory of optimization problems, routing, so the typical navigation case. You might want to not just have a point A to point B, but you might want to do a thing like routing associated with seeing the best geysers or the places that make you the most happy are places where an ambulance or a uh, well, ice cream truck, you want to get, you want to route it in places where you maximize the minimum. You want to minimize that median distance to kids along the route, these kind of things. Um, quarter location, like the ship, shipping problem. Transportation, uh, something called the so-called classical transportation problem, deals with flow allocations. So one way to think of a classical transportation problem in this hotel is if there's a fire, what are the capacities of various hallways and things? How should we allocate the flow of people in order to move us effectively and efficiently through the building or uh, through a neighborhood or evacuate for a hurricane, any number of things, or get oil through a pipeline? 
Um, facility location, where's the best spot? Zone configuration, uh, internal uh, things, like we were talking about that uh, like factory thing. There's a lot of examples of each of these. And then actually, I, I thought Carlos was gonna talk about his soccer defense problem. Um, he used to, ages ago, he was working on this, like how to defend a goal, and he was using mathematics to figure out what are the best places to put your defenders and, and things like that. And so, but there, are, basically the, these sets of things go from the top where we have uh, kind of uh, algorithms for routing, which many of you have been uh, accustomed to, to things that are, are a little stranger, like how do we locate bottlenecks? So, right. Here's, by the way, I put this slide in here. Here's the typical workflow for solving an optimization problem. You know, you figure out what your problem is, you figure out your objective to maximize or minimize, you add those constraints that you're up against, you prep the data, translate it into code, and then perform it and analyze it. Uh, really, the, I guess the thing that I think is special about this workflow compared to anything else is that even if you're dealing with points, lines, areas, or schedules, generally it comes down to making your problem into some type of network problem. So that's, I mean, it's kind of simple to say it, but it may not be natural. I got a feeling it's natural to a lot of you. But to me, when I said, I'm studying lava flows, and they said, we'll make it a network problem. And I basically had to like scratch. I had to make a grid out of the network in order to trace lava. It was actually, that's how I broke network analyst for RJS the first time. It was a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, creating, you basically networkize your problem. You set up a series of linear uh, relationships, and uh, that may not be a typical workflow that a non-computer scientist or non-engineer would think of. Um, just to be super nerdy, uh, here is a typical formulation where you have a, uh, a set of, uh, like the first thing you say is, I want to maximize this or minimize this. In fact, often it's, isn't it like you usually maximize it? Are you negative ma maximize it? That's kind of the, it's over simple. Like, it's like an engineering kind of kid here. Um, and then you have your various constraints. Uh, and so I just wanted to kind of add in here, this is one of our uh, group's seminal papers from 1971 who has like more citations than like all the rest of his students combined, like just for his uh, co maximal coverage problem. Um, with that, let's talk a little bit about these libraries that are available for the out-of-the-box stuff. Um, and also, this is a chance to tip my hat to the upcoming talks. After this talk is a whole series of transportation talks where you can dive deeper into these libraries. Here's a couple libraries and references. Uh, if you're interested in routing, uh, PG Routing is an extension for PostGIS that you can, uh, PostGIS you can play with. I guess Brandon, I can't remember his last name, was working on PG Routing and he started working on a Open Trip Planner with uh, uh, Portland. So these are some open source li libraries that go from, in some cases, fairly basic to very, very advanced until you finally get to, uh, well, in fact, the Open Trip Planner is a multimodal, uh, it's multi, multimodal enabled and you can play with it there. So you get to the like Google-esque super hot rod version, which is the open source routing machine, which uses uh, contraction hierarchies and pre-computing and kind of an algorithm to go from both sides to make it look like crazy fast. And it's kind of like what Google does. So you can drag your route around and it looks like it's doing it like in real time. Um, by the way, if you're just discovering routing algorithms, um, I have an example. Uh, in fact, this little example is a university I taught at uh, a year or so ago. How much? Uh, anyway, let's see how much time, so I don't like. Um, if you go to this, my little GitHub repository for Redlands Path, um, it basically, in fact, again, all the talk, whole talk and all these links are in GitHub. Um, it's basically maybe 200 lines of code, including the data. So you can reverse engineer and go, oh, I see how it works. And I, that's the kind of way I work. At first, I have to make it work really basic. And then I start speeding it up and iterate and make it faster and faster. So if you want to explore these libraries in some ways, choosing my, like, oh, by the way, it's really ugly code. I coded it in real time while students were watching me um, at, in class. It was a night class. Like, over about four hours, we coded the thing and uh, put it up. And it is 
point A to point B, point C, uh, those kind of things. And uh, you can go to that spot, and there's a working example too. Not just the, it's all the code. I think I have it as some kind of GNU, some kind of license. It's some kind of open source li license. So you can play with it and use it in your own classes if you have classes. Upcoming talks. So diving deeper into these, uh, I do invite you to stick around. The open source routing machine stuff, you may have seen that he's taking, uh, he's kind of doing that, uh, Dennis is doing this uh, like contraction hierarchy, like taking advantage of the nature of the network and adding some extensions to it too to do things like conflation off of uh, uh, GPS routes. In fact, Mapbox had a blog entry about that just today. So some really interesting things. In fact, I suppose he's going to give a talk on that uh, today about conflating uh, diff different type of data sources. So some good stuff coming up. So that was routing. Corridor stuff, uh, you, some of those uh, routing libraries also take into advantage corridor routing, which means routing along expanses like oceans or landscapes over terrain and such. Here's two libraries that are open source. One's from my friend Carl Grossner and Elijah Meeks, uh, one at Stanford now at Netflix, um, where they were looking at ocean routes across the Mediterranean and the, and the Roman uh, during the Roman Empire. That code is available, including their explanation of currents and uh, weather conditions uh, month to month uh, back in the ancient Roman times. And another one is more for uh, video game navigation. Reca What's that? Five, okay. Recast navigation, uh, navigation over meshes and things. So in some ways you go, well, that's a, we, could make, we could repurpose that mesh terrain as a cost surface and you could do any number of problems using that open source library. So here's our problems again. Let's say we have six here. The first two, there's open source libraries, like in some cases kind of canned, ready to go, ready for you to use. The rest of the things, not so much. Um, in fact, so this one is just a, kind of a map, but at the bottom is the, the working part of the slide, and that is these Google Operations research tools, so our Google OR tools, and the GNU Linear Programming Kit, these are general pur purpose solvers to solve equations if you have a maximum and then you have, or you're trying to maximize uh, an equation, uh, some variables against a set of constraints. That's what these libraries do. And they, they basically solve them. It's Google flavored, uh, so it goes very fast. It uses like the latest uh, and the greatest heuristics and things in some cases are the best, just the kind of the, the best of the industry to solve them. In fact, these are not spatialized at all. What our group is doing, uh, my little group of grad students, uh, three PhDs, two master's students, and uh, um, one professor, is adding a spatial API to these things, spatially enabling uh, these things, so that way we can use data that we're, we're accustomed to using, like GeoJSON and with names of, of uh, problem types, like traveling salesmen and things like that. So that's what we're working on um, and hope to continue making better and better APIs. Right now, we really hadn't considered that other people would want to look at them, um, but we, will, we are making them available uh, at Arogi. So there's github.com slash Arogi. You can start looking when we press the button to publish. Um, in fact, a sample of one of our, I, one of our APIs, just to show we actually are doing this, rather than me just talking about it, is this first thing right here is a, uh, I go, hey guys, use our API to create something. So this is a, a sample case where, uh, let's suppose you have like 30 citizens, uh, or 30 uh, demand points or something, and you're trying to figure out like, if I choose one spot, where should we all meet in order to reduce the, minium, mid of, the median distance to that one spot? Okay, we got that. Okay, but what if we have money to meet in two places instead of just one? How can we locate two places, or three? So you could say, like, if we had money for two clinics, or three clinics, where should we build them to be the shortest path, or, where, or two schools? And so we have this little example you can play with, and uh, we have all the code available for you to grab that. If you, can, you can kind of see how we set it up using, in that case, the Google Operations Toolkit. So, and, uh, by the way, within the OR toolkit by Google and a couple of us have, others have contributed to it, there are uh, samples of some other spatial problems, particularly like traveling salesmen. I think we have a traveling salesman with time windows in there. So a good place to uh, explore and play around. 
Um, with that, I'm going to uh, send it over to Carlos to talk about, um, like, yeah, your ambulance routing problem. And so, uh, thank you, and uh, from my side, and Carlos will wrap things up. Okay. Uh, hello. Whoa. What happened? Okay. Um, okay. So. Uh, okay. So this presentation here is just a brief overview of kind of what I what I've been working on. Um, not. It's not too serious. I just kind of want to get across, you know, some of the challenges and and kind of reiterate reiterate the point that. There are some problems that you can't really use, um, you know, your your toolbox and ArcGIS, QGIS, but rather need um, to somehow figure out how to uh, integrate um, these other tools, like the ones Alan's been talking about, and um, to solve a problem. And so, so the problem I work on is ambulance location, and uh, our goal, obviously, reduce mortality, morbidity, but. We have constraints, so I can't have ambulances everywhere in the city because too expensive, and ambulances are really, really expensive. Um, and there's a lot of ways we can analyze uh, ambulance systems. A lot of we can look at the inputs, so how much staff we have, how many ambulances, how many advanced, what type of equipment we have. Um, we can look at the process, how are people getting treated. We can look at outcomes, but for me, my focus is on response time. So my main goal is to make sure that ambulances could respond within some time standard uh, as often as possible. And so um, just to give you an idea how serious uh, this problem is, not too long ago, I mean, there was a big issue in San Francisco where there was a lot of very serious um, uh, emergency emergency calls that were not responded in adequate time. I mean, really, really bad. And there was calls for the fire chief to resign. And this is not only an LA type of problem because LA also had this type of problem. And so, um, yeah, so, so it's, it's a really, really valuable problem. And so how do we begin looking at this? And so um, you have your naive approaches, which are kind of this buffer, oh, let's, you know, use heat maps. And then there's what my advisor calls the box at method, which is a bunch of guys and gals sitting at a table. And that's pretty much how a lot of planning is done. And so you can imagine how efficient that is. And I mean, we can use uh, a lot of off-the-shelf tools like you would find in ArcGIS, QGIS, which are covering models, which essentially uh, look at, you know, okay, well, if there's an ambulance here and a demand point is located within some time standard, then it's considered covered. And then Alan just talked about the P-median approach where you're trying to minimize the average travel time. And so the thing about these problems, though, is that they're just not good enough. And with ambulances in particular, you know, you have two main issues. You have sto uh, stochastic demand and you have congestion. So these models kind of assume that these ambulances was, will always be there, but that's not true. And they also assume that demand is deterministic, which is also not true. And the second thing is that, um, unlike the supermarket problem, optimality does matter. And, and like I said, uh, there's a lot of instances where every single second makes a difference. And so when it comes to this, we can't necessarily say, ah, this is good enough. And this is particularly true when a lot of uh, uh, public agencies are seeing uh, a, a great amount of uh, budget cuts. And so in a way, they're being asked to do more with less. And so this is kind of where we come in. But the point I just want to draw is that traditional GIS spatial optimization, uh, spatial analysis tools are just not very useful for solving these types of problems. And so when I'm trying to solve this problem, this is kind of my workflow. First, I have to understand, OK, what does the system look like? You know, what is the geography? What is the environment? And then I formulate a location model, usually as a linear program or a mixed integer program. And then um, this program will give me some type of solution. 
And the thing is, I can't just hand over to say, okay, well, my model says that this is what you should do. So um, I have to simulate it just to make sure that it's, that it's good. And so the problem with this, though, is that these three things, it, the workflow is just really, really messy. And for one, the data, oh, it's just, just getting some real type of data is just a nightmare. It's like trying to convince an agency to fork over some data is just a real huge challenge. And then the second part is when they do have data, when they do collect data, it's not, the measurements are not exactly what we need or, or, the, or they're very poor in how they collect them or they don't document them, very unreliable. And so it just becomes very difficult. And, and when they do provide data, it, 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 the, the transparency aspect of it really, really makes the analysis a lot more difficult. And then the second difficulty is the software. So fortunately, um, when I'm working on my research through UCSB, I have access to a lot of software that uh, these companies graciously provide. But for someone who doesn't have uh, this type of privilege, it becomes very difficult. And so if you're a public agency and you already have a limited budget, good luck affording Arena, Moselle, uh, uh, Express, um, just a lot of tools out there that are really good, but really out of the reach of, of, of uh, agencies with, uh, with low um, economic capabilities. And not only that, but then a lot of these software require you to learn the, the language. And so, I mean, for me, I can sit down and you know, take a week or two and learn the language, but a lot of these agencies don't have the time or the resources to, to have that luxury. And, and then the next part is the ad hoc workflows. It's really problematic because you'll be working on one project and then all of a sudden, you know, that project is finished and you've kind of abandoned all that work. And so it really, really makes things difficult. And then the last part is that a lot of software is black box. So something's going on, it's telling me to do this and I don't know how they're doing it and they don't want to say because it's proprietary even though that most of the stuff they're using is in the literature. Somehow it's still proprietary. And yeah, beats me. But um, there was this uh, famous case out of Florida where they, were, they hired a company to, uh, I guess they were supposed to predict where the next emergency phone calls uh, were supposed to come from. And I think they charged Pinellas County somewhere around a million bucks a year or something for it and didn't do very well. And we don't know why because we can't look into this proprietary code. And so kind of uh, the role for open source in here I think is, is really great. Um, for one, once we start having this open data, then we can, uh, us, us analysts or academics, can start recommending, um, making recommendations to these public agencies that say, hey, if you're collecting this type of data, you should try to be more organized about it, otherwise we get a lot of noise. And it's particularly important in, um, in ambulance because if I don't know conditions such as traffic, if I don't know what the actual response times are, because there's like a million ways you can, you can measure response time, like for instance, do we start measuring when the phone call came in? Do we measure when the firefighters actually get the message or when they go out the door? Like this makes a really big difference. And, and your analysis can change depending on, um, on, on what you're measuring. And so, and then the second part is that we can actually start helping out all these agencies by performing our own analysis. So maybe, um, you know, the San Francisco Fire Department can't perform these really sophisticated analysis, but someone in graduate school definitely can. And so if we just had that data, we could probably contribute to them. And similarly, we help them and then they help us because there's a lot of models I have, but I'm like, I, I don't know how good it is unless I actually have some real life data to test. And so it's kind of a win-win, I feel, for, for, uh, for opening up a lot of data. And fortunately, that's kind of the trend I'm seeing, that a lot of agencies are starting to release their data. But again, they need to still be more transparent about how they're collecting it, um, 
because again, it, it, it really affects the analyses. And then the second part, the open source software, um, I really like it because it definitely lowers the barriers to entry in terms of cost, but also in terms of knowledge, because sure, you might not be some spatial optimization expert, but I can put enough work into a, uh, say, QGIS extension where you don't need to know a lot of what's going on in the background. You know, I can program these uh, models that take into account stochastic demand and uh, congestion, and that's kind of all you need to know. And so, um, I mean, and then you would have the references if you wanted to know more about when it's appropriate, when it's not appropriate, but just having that, I feel, just increases, increases uh, lowers the knowledge bar barriers. And then the last part is the streamlining of workflows. I mean, when I was working on my project, it's like I had to use this software piece, and then I had to go to another one. And it was just really messy, really ad hoc, a lot of C, uh, CSV files floating around, and it was just a nightmare. And so um, I think it was the, uh, there was a, bi a big data um, presentation yesterday about, about how they were using these open source tools to kind of manage workflows. And I think that would be great because if I didn't, if I had to not leave, say, QGIS to do all my work, it would just, it would just increase productivity tremendously. And so, from my point of view, I'm very, very big fan of, of open source. So. That's it. Yeah. All right. Cool. So, uh, okay. Well, um, I guess that wraps up things. Um, it, yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess, I, I don't know what time it is, but if you have some questions, there's, like, I, I love taking questions, but at the same time, whenever I'm in the audience and people ask questions, I feel like I'm a hostage, that I have to wait. So, if you have questions, ask them, but you will not hurt anyone's feelings if you walk out of the room anytime <laughs> in the question and answer period. Just letting you know. Okay, any questions? Yeah. Uh, Ask him. Uh, <laughs> on, the, on the API participation yeah. uh, for, for the, the optimization model, are you focusing on particular languages? Are you just based on API for particular languages? Or are you trying to, to go in more, uh, so, going in, uh, in more different, uh, more different uh, tools? Right now, in terms of the spatialization of this stuff, um, so far, we've used Java, uh, Google OR tools, which has been, but by the way, the, the background here, uh, so Google OR tools is in C++. Um, so, um, but they have all these hooks in via Python, Java, all this kind of stuff. So I like, I do Android programming, so I go, oh, I'm gonna use Java. So that way I can do my geyser thing on my Android app. Um, but because we wanna do more web stuff that makes me more comfortable, I like Python for that stuff. But, so right now, the answer is everything is Java. However, one reason to be at a conference like this is, in some ways, we're announcing that we're doing this. So, you as the community, I would like first to invite you to join us in helping do this, and also influence, let's influence each other. If you say it's a waste of your time, you know what the market needs more than See, we're, we're creating APIs to solve problems for ourselves. Um, we're doing it so I can do better studies on, on, well, so I can be a better professor on the side. And then like, I hope that maybe, it, well, in fact, I've had requests to create like boardroom decision makers. They wanna know like what happens is we've had this uh, thing where people will ask, oh, we see you do all this optimization. Can you, can you make an iPad app where the, board, where the board can sit there and play with like the location of warehouses and then kind of, kind of eyeball, play with it and get some quick and dirty answers. And then we send the formula that we just created over to our engineering, tech, our engineering guys and they double check it and do the real heavy lifting. Because uh, right now what happens is the guys are thinking in the boardroom, they send some kind of, um, nebulous request over to engineering, and then they send the answer back like, oh, this would be the best place for a, a warehouse. 
And then there's kind of this like back and forth of many days sometimes between each of these. But I'd like to just try to, there's been a request to help reduce that load. And so uh, one of those is, well, I, I know Android enough to play with it and make Geyser apps, so I can play with that UI and, and that in Java. But I am very interested uh, as in the hallways and stuff, please do talk to me uh, if you have your own opinion that you'd like to provide. Because um, I, I certainly, I mean, I, some of you are probably experts in various languages. I just make things work. Like I know Java and I have Python, I'm terrible at C++, but I had to learn it somewhere as like a freshman, um, these kind of things. So I do whatever it takes to get the job done. And pro I, I would hate to make my thing and only have one guy use it. And I am willing to learn some stuff that's new if it impacts a thousand people or a million or a hundred million. You know, I think the type of problems that you can solve using this type of approach can be world changing and there's no reason to do it in some kind of half-baked, I'm doing it just to solve my geyser problem. Let's solve it, let's use things that help optimize how fire trucks work and how people plan cities and, and these types of things. So let's do it right. Any, so, um, any other questions? Yeah, in the back. I have a question about the annual problem. Yeah, yeah. Oh, so for the simulation, uh, we actually have a, we, we created the software from the bottom ground up. And so we coded it in C++. And that's kind of the thing that I'm trying to get away from is these ad hoc pieces of software into more, um, into more of a generic type of uh, platform where you can change from, say, ambulances to, oh, now we're doing type Uber type of problems. And so, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of the goal right now. Is How big is your study area? Huh? How big like, um, is this, like a San Francisco size or a little? Oh, town? well, the thing is, that's, that, well, the beauty of the work is that you, it's supposed to scale up uh, very well, except um, there are some difficulties about it. So the simulation part would, would work just fine, but the optimization one, that's kind of a dissertation topic um, that I'm going, so, <laughs> Oh, it, it definitely was successful, but I was definitely kind of disappointed because I thought, man, if I would have just made some generic framework that I can just reuse over and over again, I, that would have been perfect. But I was, yeah, I was definitely uh, satisfied with the simulation uh, software that we built. Um, I think we're, we hit time. Thank you very much for attending. I appreciate that there's a crowd. That's, that's really great. So thanks again, and uh, please be in touch if you're uh, interested in this kind of thing. Thanks again.